I want to thank our sponsors, Athletic Greens, who created AG1, one of the most innovative packets of supplements, including 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. These ingredients support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. I personally started using Athletic Greens and love the way I feel in the morning after I drink it. And I no longer have energy crashes throughout the day. And the best part is that it's delicious. The founder of Athletic Greens created AG1 because he experienced a ton of gut health and ended up on a complicated and expensive supplement routine to recover. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Yasmeen. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash Yasmeen, Y-A-S-M-E-E-N, to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hi, my name is Yasmeen Tarehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. Today's episode is with Dr. Laura Berman. Dr. Laura Berman is a sex, love, and relationship therapist who has spent her career helping people how to love and be loved better. She's also a New York Times bestselling author of nine books, and her humorous advice has made her a well-loved media personality. She's been on a number of different major news and daytime outlets. She was on The Oprah Winfrey Show and has also hosted a ton of television programs on Discovery Health, Showtime, and OWN. She is the award-winning host of the show, The Dr. Berman Show and Uncovered Radio. And I recently read her book, Quantum Love. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I recently had the pleasure of meeting uh, Dr. Laura a couple weeks ago. So I'm so excited to have this conversation. Uh, So welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. So Laura, to kick it off, can you tell us for the audience listening, what exactly is Quantum Love? Um, Quantum Love is really a practice and it's one that comes supernaturally to us. It's our birthright. We're born with it. Um, but we, it gets conditioned out of us <laughs> from the time we, we come in. We're born these beautiful quantum love machines. Um, and somewhere along the way, the majority of us have forgotten the power that we have. But really, quantum love is the process of harnessing your body's atomic energy because we're all made of pure vibrating energy on an atomic level harnessing that energy in service to your love life, to manifest the love life and the relationships you want. So can you talk to us about that, like what that practically means? So if I was a person who wanted to bring in this type of love, like how would I be feeling? What is, what sort of feeling state or emotional state should I be in to, to be able to do that? Right. Well, so for everyone, it's really different. So the key to really quantum love is, Um, operationalizing what I'm just standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So it's not like I invented this. I just am a science geek at heart (laughs) and and went through my own dark night of the soul um, where as these dark nights do, you know, which ended up being a doorway uh, that where I stumbled upon this and then went down the rabbit hole and started exploring it and needed to understand it. And then through that process, uncovered a system that made sense to me. Um, so it's, so basically here's the key, right? We all know about the secret and the law of attraction, you know, whatever you want to call it, that we are all co-creating our reality Every millisecond, we already are co create, we're already manifesting everything that happens to us. We're just not conscious of it. And what quantum love helps you do is get really conscious of it. So when we, when we hear about, 
the law of attraction, for instance, you know, in, in, as it pertains to your question, you know, I want to call love in, right? Most of us would just say, okay, I'm going to envision that perfect person. I'm going to clean out my closet and make room for his or her, their clothes. I'm going to, you know, turn my metaphorical cab light on um, to let people know I'm av- available, meaning that I'll look up from my smartphone when I'm in the coffee shop or when I'm walking <laughs> into my building for work or whatever it is and engage with the world so that I'm giving out cues that I'm open to being approached. And, you know, all of those things are in what I would call the logistical field of life or the 3D field, which is very valuable. And most of my career before quantum love and still much of my career is spent in that 3D field. There are lots of practical things you need to do or could do to call love in. But the the tricky part and the place where I feel like the law of attraction or the secret has often fallen short is that going to that point doesn't really work. Envisioning your perfect mate, it's the same as like writing yourself a $10 million check, right? I'm going to write myself a $10 million check and then that's going to, you know, and I'm going to decide I already have it. And then that's going to call love in, I mean, excuse me, call that money in. The problem is that the key to manifesting is in our in in moving your body into the energetic alignment of that which you desire. So taking the $10 million check, if I just write myself a $10 million check, it's probably not going to happen. If I move my body into the energetic frequency of ex- of what I would feel like emotionally and inside my body holding that, you know, looking at my bank account full of $10 million, right? Or looking at a pile of cash on the bed in front of me, (laughs) how would I feel, right? And that is really what translates to the quantum field and what really creates our reality. Because back to what I was originally saying, we are all pure atomic vibrating energy and our body holds an energetic frequency, And that freak, we all kind of have this baseline energetic frequency and we're all, uh, if you're perceiving, if we're perceiving one another with our five senses, then we're vibrating in harmony with one another, right? So you and I, Yasmin, are, in order for us to even have this conversation, we're vibrating in harmony. We are, your, you know, energetic frequency and my energetic frequency is in harmony, but each of us, our frequency changes and shifts based on our conscious and unconscious emotional states. That's really the key to what shifts your body's frequency. And so it's one thing to think about what you want and love, but when you move your body into the energetic frequency of how you would feel waking up to that person every single morning, that is what translates into the quantum field where all possibilities exist. And Mm. so I don't know how much you've talked about quantum physics or the quantum field in your show, but that's really the science. Quantum physics is the science underneath the law of attraction or manifesting what you most desire because in the quantum field, all possibilities exist. For instance, quantum physicists, when they do experiments, they have to leave the room. They have to do those experiments in a vacuum because they discovered early that the scientists' conscious and even unconscious expectations of the outcome of the experiment were going to create that outcome. So this, so expand that to what we're wanting to manifest, right? It's, it's our expectations, the energy of our expectations almost radiates out. Our energetic field, we've been able to even measure 10 to 12 feet, but it goes much further than that. Our energetic frequency emanates out, and then that creates the form and the manifest reality that we experience. So when you're called, this is a very long way to answer your original question. I love it. But what, but, but I think it's important to explain because when you, you want to call love in, right? Think about what you want. Think about those logistical 3D things. But most importantly, how do you most want to feel in love? How do you most want to feel? right? And, and the more you cultivate, so it's different for you and for me and for anyone, right? One person, it may be, I most want to feel safe and cherished. Another person, it's playful and adventurous, passionate, excited, you know, whatever it is, like choose your top three ways you most want to feel in love. And as you cultivate those feelings inside you, and there are systems that I teach to do this, 
Um, but they come very naturally to us because we're all unconsciously doing this anyway, but this is doing it with intention. When you do that and you cultivate those feelings inside you, several things start to happen. So let's just say playful, right, is how you really want to feel in love, one of the feelings that you're going to work with, right? So maybe you choose three to five and you work with one at a time. What you'll notice as you start cultivating that feeling of playfulness in your body is that all of a sudden, all sorts of opportunity for, for play will start showing up. You know, you'll get an invitation to go to a, I don't know, a, an escape room <laughs> event, right? Or something that you, you know, something, some crazy costume party or something that would feel really fun and playful to you. You'll meet people who are engaged and really, you know, aligned with you and wanting to play. They'll introduce you to a potential partner or you'll meet or you'll attract in that potential partner directly because now you are a frequency match for play. Wow. Right. So that's really what we want to do is, is make our bodies an energetic frequency match for that, which we want to create in love. And this works, whether you're trying to call love in or whether you're trying to change the way your partner shows up to you for you in your current relationship. It, you know, in fact, in a relationship, it's almost like a Jedi mind trick. Cause when you start to <laughs> become a frequency match of how you want your partner to show up for you, they immediately match that, whether they intend to or not, or know it or not. Wow. Fascinating. You said so many things that I want to double click on. Um, So I want to talk about in a relationship, how you can do that. So we can maybe have that as a second follow-up question, but also how long do you have to hold that feeling state? You know, and because I think for a lot of people, that's probably difficult for them to shift into a new feeling state when they have more or less like a default state. Yeah. So um, when you coach people, do you have like some kind of time uh, practice that you encourage people to do? And how fast have you seen this work? I've seen it work super fast, right? But you're absolutely right. A lot of it depends on how far from that emotional state you tend to live, right? So if you're most longing to back to playful, I don't know why we're doing that, but evidently maybe I need to have a need for play and that's why I keep bringing <laughs> oh. that up, right? But, but just you, you know, following this thread, right? If you want to feel playful in love or in life and you tend to live in a very serious place or a very f- afraid place, you know, most of your time, it's going to take a lot more practice to cultivate that state in your life and a lot more conscious intention than if you're someone who, you know, does play from time to time and really enjoys that, but also isn't necessarily um, cultivating it to the extent that they need to or want to in order to attract that in. The general rule of thumb is that if you, you know, and, and I'm not saying you have to walk around in a playful state of mind this often, but if you if you stay in, you know, one of the things I describe in the in quantum love is is I, you know, this quantum love map, right? Because each emotional state we hold has an energetic frequency. And shame and guilt are the lowest frequency emotions. So forget play. If you're spending a lot of time of, you know, of your conscious waking moments in shame and guilt, your life probably isn't so great. You know, not only because it's painful to live in shame and guilt, but because you are a frequency match for experiences that create shame and guilt in you. Right. Um, and so you probably are having a lot of yucky relationships and experiences throughout your day. So to start with, right, one of the things that I try to teach people is that if you can spend even 51% of your time in a play in what I would call the quantum love zone of the quantum love map. So if shame and guilt is the lowest, you know, and then you have anger, resentment, you know, all the way up. Once you get to curiosity and openness, that's the tipping point into the quantum love zone. Um, so you have curiosity, openness, forgiveness, um, playfulness, excitement, uh, joy, bliss. You know, most of us sp- don't spend a lot of time in bliss, but in those quote unquote more positive emotions, right? If you can spend 51% of your day just there, your entire life will change, okay? And now you are already a frequency match for 
lots more yummy things in your life, experiences, people, circumstances. That is extremely powerful in and of itself. And now if you then want to, so often I need to get people to that baseline, right? Before they can either, because you're not going to be, if you're living in shame and guilt, it's going to be next to impossible (laughs) to cultivate a feeling of play in a regular basis, right? So first we got to get you to a place of at least openness and curiosity of slowly kind of changing your, you know, and sometimes it's quick and sometimes it's slow depending on how attached you are to your stories and beliefs, because every feeling we have is a result of a, of a story we're telling ourselves about something, right? So I look outside and it's raining and I have a story that's yummy and cozy and you look outside and it's raining and you have a story that it's dangerous and, and scary because, you know, maybe you had a car wreck when you were young during a storm or something, right? So, so both of us have different stories about the same circumstances, and those stories create feelings. When you see the rain, you feel scared because of your stories. When I feel the rain, I feel cozy and cherished because of my stories, right? And our stories come from our beliefs, right? How we interpret circumstances, what we believe about the world and ourselves. And so sometimes it's a matter of cycling back to the core belief or the core stories that are in the way of cultivating that feeling that you most want to experience, or at least loosening the grip of those lower frequency feelings, if that makes sense. And so then once you kind of have started to practice that, it's so much easier to move into that which you want to create following our example, playfulness, right? So what I would have someone do once they've reached that baseline point is to every single day, at least twice a day, even if you spend 10 minutes a day moving your body, and I can spell this out for you if you want me to, but moving your body into that energetic state of the feeling you most want to cultivate in love or in whatever that is, then just during that day, things will start to shift and change. Wow. And then it cultivates more of that. It's like a self ful- self-fulfilling prophecy or cycle that starts to feed on itself. I love that so much, Laura. And I love that you are mentioning play because uh, that is one thing I am calling in so hard this year <laughs> myself. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I, I definitely need more play in my life. So, so I'm going to hold that feeling state. I love that. And, and you mentioned also, you know, how you can shift in your own relationship. If you were, if you already have a relationship and perhaps your partner is kind of uh, throwing you off or, you know, there's, there's conflict or disagreement. Um, can you talk to us about practical ways that you can shift out of that? Like, do you also do the same practice for moving into a different feeling state? It's similar. Um, It's similar for sure. But here's one of the cool things about love relationships or any relationship with with people that we're very close to. On a quantum level, on an atomic level, we are always, all of us, no matter who we are, are always in training to one another. What that means is we're constantly kind of moving into um, energetic alignment with each other. And we're usually doing that completely unconsciously. So if you take 10 people who come together in a room, let's say for a cocktail party, they are all unconsciously matching each other's energetic frequency until they find the common median, right? And they're all kind of matching. So you might have someone come in who's super depressed and someone who comes in on top of the world and the energy of everyone just kind of shifts to some happy medium where they can all be in harmony with one another. What gets really cool is when you get conscious of this, you walk into that cocktail party holding your own frequency and everybody entrains to you. And when you're in a love relationship, what's really interesting about that is that you are atomically entangled, right? So when two atoms are entangled with one another, they are spinning, vibrating at exactly the same energetic frequency where if I were to take one of those two, you know, entangled atoms and shoot it to the moon and start turning it the other way once it was there at the same instant, the atom here on earth would start turning at the in the same direction. It's what Einstein, toward the end of his life, when all of these discoveries started being made, he was completely freaked out. He called it spooky action at a distance. That was his (laughs) scientific term for it. Um, 
But so the reason that's important in a love relationship is that talk about entrainment, your partner is like immediately matching your energetic frequency. And, you know, they've even done studies. There was a University of Washington study where they took one partner and put them in one side of, you know, in a love relationship. They took one partner and put them on one side of of, of the building or of the campus in a brain scan. And they took another partner somewhere else and they shined a light in the eye of that partner. And at the same instant, the ocular receptors in the brain of the first partner lit up. Wow. You know, it's why we can feel our partner's mood before we even, you know, right when we walk in the house before we even see them, right? So when you start to get really, really clear, let's say you're about to have a difficult conversation, you get really, really clear about how you want to go, how you want it to go, how you're going to feel. You move your body into that energetic frequency before you walk into the room with that person and they immediately match you there. If you want your partner to show up more romantically, you're literally doing the same thing that you would do to call love in, right? But you're cultivating the energetic frequency of romance and matching that with intention. So one of the examples I give in the book, I talk about my own marriage a lot because that's how I kind of discovered this. I first discovered it with my kids, how powerful it was. And then I looked over at my husband and I was like, hmm, <laughs> maybe this would work with him. And he's impossible. I mean, that's one of the reasons I love him, but he is so stubborn and so smart and impossible to win an argument with. And the first time I tried this with him, he lost his train of thought, which has never happened in the middle of a discussion and just like immediately became flexible and open to what I was saying. And it blew my mind. And that's really what started me on the journey of, of kind of figuring this out and systems for it and working with my clients and couples and, and pulling it all together. Because um, one of the examples I give in the book is this woman who got frustrated every New Year's Eve because she would have to, it, she, they had little kids. And so she would have to like make the whole extravaganza fun for the kids and make it a family thing. And she was just tired of it. She wanted her husband to do it. And she had mentioned it a couple of times and he wasn't really showing up. And, you know, it was, it was a symptom of a, a much larger issues in the relationship, but this was something that was really a sticking point with her and also a great opportunity to give her an example of the power she really had to change things. And so we got really, I helped her get really, really clear about envisioning what the ideal New Year's Eve as a family would look like and feel like, including her husband's role in that. I helped her get really, really clear on how she would feel emotionally as she was experiencing that and, and helped her kind of anchor that sensation of that energetic frequency in her body so she could keep cultivating that. And then she sent me an email that literally he did almost exactly what she was envisioning. Um, and, and that's, I hear those stories all the time and they certainly apply to my life as well. Most recently, I really wanted to go skiing, uh, last winter and I didn't care. Like I wanted to go to Arrow. You know, I live in LA. I was like, I was fine going to Arrowhead, Big Bear. It's not like I needed a big extravaganza to Utah or Aspen or whatever. And um, my kids and my husband just weren't interested. And I really had this n- desire to be on a family ski trip because to me, that's like maximum bonding time because no one's on their smartphones and you're doing something active and you're in nature. And so I just set that intention, envisioned it move my body into the energetic frequency of it actually happening and the connection and play and joy and intimacy that that was going to create among us. And within two weeks, my, one of my kids said, you know what, maybe we should go to Arrowhead <laughs> you know, for the weekend. And sure enough, you know, that's what we did. So it really, you know, I don't say anything. It's like my secret trick. But um, I mean, they know obviously <laughs> about quantum love, but they they don't. It somehow doesn't occur to them that that's what I'm doing. That's amazing. I love that so much. So, and this keeps happening over and over again for you. And do you feel that, um, you know, now that your kids know, do they do they say anything like, <laughs> you know, mom, are you, are you programming this or? <laughs> <laughs> No, they don't even, it doesn't occur to them. Um, I Maybe it doesn't occur to them in part because they're still young enough to think I'm an idiot, you know? Oh. Um, uh, you know, they're in those years. Uh, my youngest is 17. But my oldest, actually, he doesn't think about it, but he does know 
how, you know, he does know how powerful I am. <laughs> um, and he's commented on that before. I don't think he realizes in the moment that I'm, um, you know, and I obviously don't do it all the time. It's not like, you know, that would be exhausting, right? Controlling right. them 24, you know, <laughs> it would be a form of control. And I always say to people, you know, use these powers for good, not evil. But, um, but I do like, even with my son getting into, he's doing his college applications right now. And I found myself moving into sort of the opposite of what, you know, what I call the quantum love zone is ego, you know, the ego frequency I, where you're wanting to fix, manage and control things. Right. And I find myself starting to do that. And even just this morning, I was like, okay, I really want him for his own sake to step into this more and take responsibility. How would I feel if he really stepped into this and took the harm, you know, took it by the reins, invested in the application process, worked on his essays and all the other things, letters of recommendation, all the crap you need for these applications. And I'm just going to step back from this because it's not my job to fix, manage and control anything, much less another person. And so I'm just going to step back and move into the energetic frequency of him doing this and being accepted to like the perfect school for him and how that would feel. And I just did that sort of meditation this morning and I'm going to start cultivating it. And my guess is he's going to step into it. But I forget sometimes because I get stuck in mama mode and fear and <laughs> scarcity, just like the rest of us. I just know now how to shift out of it and actually take the power back. What a beautiful exercise, I think, for everyone to experience uh, and experiment themselves is putting themselves into the space of how would I feel if I already had this thing or if this already happened and just really cultivating that throughout the day, 51% of the time at least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about quantum sex. <laughs> mm -hmm. What does that mean uh, in, your, in your words? What does quantum sex mean? I love quantum sex. In fact, that's going to be my next book, I think, um, really diving into that because it's so much fun. And I feel like in many ways, it's the antidote to what's happening in our world right now sexually. Um, quantum sex is really, you know, applying the principles of quantum love of understanding your body's energetic system and how it moves um, and using that and harnessing that in a sexual sense. So it uses a lot of the principles of Tantra and Taoism and Kama Sutra, of course, and a lot of those ancient techniques, you know, especially Tantra, talk about the exchange. I mean, ener sex is like a, a massive energy exchange, um, and you are literally taking someone else's energy into you if you are on the receptive side, right? And you are, you know, if you're, if that, per, if you're, you know, we don't have to get into the specifics. I don't know how, how, how graphic I should get on, on your podcast, but, <laughs> you know, if you're on the receiving end, male or female or somewhere in between, um, you are taking that person's energy in. And if you are on the giving side, you are also bathing, right? Surrounding yourself in that partner, in your partner's energy. So there is a significant energy exchange and in some cases an energetic hangover <laughs> to sex, but there is also amazing power there because for most of us, you know, sexual sensation is really localized to the genitals, right? To the pelvis and the genitals. That's where we feel it. But with quantum sex, you're learning how to pull that um, energy up from your genitals all the way up through your chakras or up your spine. You can circle it around. You can circle it between the two of you. You can shoot it out the top of your head and it allows you to have these full body orgasms. But it also like to me, the most frequent question I get asked, no matter where I speak in what community is, you know, if I had to name the most common question I get about sex, it's how do you keep things, you know, how do you spice it up? How do you keep things interesting in a long-term relationship? And, you know, in that logistical 3D field, right, I could be giving you 365 tips, tools, toys, role plays to try to spice it up and get out of your comfort zone. And that's certainly what I did for a lot of my career. And I still do that. I mean, there's a lot of fun to be had there. 
But within a year or a year and a half after you'd done them all, <laughs> you know, and they weren't new anymore, you'd come back to me and say, okay, now help me spice it up. Because what I've realized is what we're really looking for when we say that is that we're looking for intensity. We're looking for an intense experience of a sensual and sexual exchange that, you know, many of us think is only relegated to that very first phase of the relationship, the infatuation phase. Um, but it actually is even more powerful when there is that bond and that connection there. I mean, you can have quantum sex with a stranger, but it's even better when it's with someone with whom you feel deep emotional intimacy. Um, so it's, it's really cool. And I have a whole chapter in the book where I give you techniques and, um, and so forth, but it's really fun to play with. Um, and, and you can have your, you can do it with your partner completely conscious and both of you engaged, or you can just do it yourself. I mean, I, I often like to do it myself and not tell my husband until afterwards <laughs> what I did <laughs> because it's a way of exper doing an experiment. Like, is he going to feel me swirling energy around, you know, his penis, right? Pink, I call it the pink sparkly vagina maneuver, right? <laughs> Is he going to feel that and respond to that or not, right? If I don't tell him and he doesn't know what that's happening, and then I can, I have some real data, you know, and then he comes back or I see his reaction in the moment or, you know, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So for those who want to learn more about quantum sex, you can check out that chapter in the book. And I also want to talk about, you know, how do you move forward into this idea of quantum love when life hits you with surprises or you're faced with difficulties? You know, how do you help people navigate from that? Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, I have a lot of issues with um, many in the personal empowerment, you know, or spiritual community, the teachers who focus so much on you know, just think positive and positive affirmations and tapping it away. And, you know, I definitely think there is a role for all of those for sure as a Band-Aid, you know, but they are not a solution. And so um, I think it's really easy in the personal empowerment community to be misled into accidentally, you know, what we call spiritually bypassing and, and and that is really important for quantum love because you can say all the beautiful things to yourself in the mirror that you want, but if your body and your subconscious are saying, yeah, bullshit, go on with your bad self, that's the energetic frequency that you're holding, right? You're not going to hold, you, you're not, the, your frequency is set not by what you do, but by who you are. And so often, if your life is just really sucking right now, and, and Lord knows I have been in those places, um, and I have had very dark nights of the soul, many of them <laughs> throughout my life, um, the only way to, to shift is to g not go around it, over it, or under it, but to really go into the, the source of the pain and allow yourself to fully feel it. And sometimes that's a process that takes time, you know, especially if you had a tr trauma in your history or, you know, a tra like a big tragedy, um, you're going to need help kind of moving through and somatically, which is essentially energetically releasing that density from your body. And then you can start to shift but, but what I find is so often we stay stuck in those very dark places because we don't understand how we, we want to do anything we can. We think the Pandora's box is going to open if we allow ourselves to really feel the pain of what we're going through. If I let myself cry or I let myself feel as desperate as I want to right now, I will never, you know, I'll get lost. There's no bottom there, you know. And if you think about Pandora's box, at the very bottom, once all that craziness was released, was hope, you know, and, and so it's the same thing for us. And, and I have found this in my own life time and time again, when, when I'm brave enough to go all the way into the pain and allow myself to feel it, you know, it, are, it doesn't take you over. Your body actually is so brilliant and your system is so brilliant that really to allow an emotion to pass through you and release 
often only takes five to 10 minutes. And then the pressure valve is so significantly released and the density is released and your energetic frequency rises. So I'm not saying you have to do like a whole bout of six months of trauma work before, you know, if you had trauma in your life before you can start changing your life with quantum love, you can start changing it with your first authentic release of density, you're already at a higher frequency as a baseline then. Mm, Yes. Yes. That's so powerful. And I I also just want to like highlight that because I think a a lot of us grew up in a a culture where we were taught not to feel our feelings and to sort of just disassociate and disconnect from these darker emotions or numb out uh, with an addiction. And I, I love that. I think it's an interesting balance like of allowing us to be in in this somatic space of sitting in our emotions. I actually did a little bit of somatic therapy and it was so game changing, just being able to sit Mm -hmm. in feelings, seeing them move and then actually feeling myself, you know, in a different energetic space. And it did, again, you're right. It didn't take very long, even just, you know, five minutes versus years of uh, covering it up, right? With, <laughs> and disassociating and exactly. from it and squelching it, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think what I've noticed is that sometimes people do, though, stay in these states kind of forever in this victimhood mm-hmm. state. So I think it's like an interesting balance where it's like feel your feelings, really, really connect with that. And then, you know, at some point when when you do feel, you know, a release, it is also okay to let the past be the past and move on. Absolutely. And and you often need to shift, you know, and I have a whole chapter in the book about shift moves, right? Ways you can shift in the moment um, out of those dense, you know, once you've done a release or even if you just, you know, aren't in a position to do the release at that moment, right? Like let's say you're at work and you're feeling triggered or something and you, it's not like you have the opportunity to go and decompensate in the bathroom at that moment, right? Then, then there are ways that you can, you know, those band-aid approaches that you can shift, including after the release, um, to, I often cement it like with a crazy dance, like no one's watching or working out or, um, you know, breathing the energy into the earth, or there's lots of different ways that you can kind of maximize the release and bring yourself back to center. Um, but either way, you know, whether you're, you actually have gone into the feeling that you're trying to avoid or, if you haven't, it's just that if you haven't, it's more of a band aid. If you have, it's more of an anchor. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. Uh, so, Laura, I want to talk a little bit about some of the ways that your clients have made changes with your process. Can you talk to us about maybe one story or two stories anecdotally of, of course, not mentioning any names, but perhaps yeah. ways that people have applied some of the, the practices that you shared? Oh my gosh, there's so many cases, names and circumstances changed, of course, in the book. Um, but, you know, I think it's, uh, well, I, I there, let me see if I can think of an example. It happens every day that I hear from people that they have called love in. Um, you know, I even went through this process with a, a woman I worked with for many years and I knew her long enough and, and saw her almost daily long enough that I knew a lot, you know how you do, well, at least I do with people I work with, I know everything about their love right. lives, whether <laughs> I want to or not. Um, and I usually want to. And in her case, she was single and it had a really traumatic, abusive relationship in her teen years and was super powerful in the world. And, you know, one of those women who's lighting the world on fire in a good way, um, but really was struggling to find love and had pretty much determined that like that wasn't in the cards. It wasn't in the cards for her to have a family or to, you know, and I finally challenged her one day and she admitted that that was just, you know, what she thought her lot was. So she was, but not really what she wanted. And so we started working on really shifting, you know, her stories, right? And and also her beliefs about what she was worthy of. You know, a lot about what I talk about in Quantum Love is those worthiness killing stories that we adopt early in life. Either we inherit (laughs) from our caregivers because they have that worthiness killing story and they paint the world with that for us, you know, 
or we internalize it through our, you know, big T and little T traumas along the way. Um, and so in her case, you know, we had to start, I, I, I started helping her just starting with challenging her beliefs, like just the veracity of those beliefs and then slowly trying on a better feeling belief. Cause it's not like you can go from, you know, thinking the worst possible things about yourself to suddenly deciding you're the best thing ever, right? You know, I always say that our beliefs are like a scared little rabbit. Uh, I remember reading this story about this guy who uh, wanted a rabbit to, he saw a rat, he was on vacation and he was sitting on the porch. He saw this little bunny on the edge of the yard and he decided that every day he would put some lettuce or carrots, you know, starting on the edge of the yard where the bunny was and slowly bringing it closer and closer and closer to the porch until at the end of the vacation, the bunny had come up to the porch and was, you know, and our beliefs are the same way. We have to coax them into just a little bit better feeling belief and a little bit better feeling belief. And, um, and so we did that. And we also, I also started helping her get really clear about what she wanted in a love relationship. And it was really interesting because I was with her for the duration, you know, first, what she thought she wanted was someone who, you know, was, uh, really faithful and really kind and really safe because that was speaking to her trauma. And that's what she called in. And it was this great guy who was very safe and faithful, but he didn't ever want to go out. He wasn't really comfortable with her devotion to her career. And um, he could be a little controlling because he didn't want her to have too broad of a life because he didn't right? So that one eventually got kicked to the curb. So then she had more information. Okay, now I want someone who, you know, is faithful, kind, safe, but also, you know, under has his own life, right? And, um, and respects my career. And so then she called that in. And then that was all great, except the guy had no internal motivation of his own. So he was like, yeah, go on with your bad self. Go out. But like he was sitting home playing video games 24-7. And so that didn't work, right? And then finally, she's like, all that and someone who has passion and has drive and, you know, can eat, can not only understand my drive, but has their own dreams. And then, you know, once she moved into those frequencies, that's when she called in the man who's now her husband of two years. Um, so this was all told maybe a two-year process of these relationships, right? Um, and I'm not saying all of us have to go through that. The clearer you are on what you want, and sometimes it is true that what you want is in the short term just an antidote to what you had, <laughs> you know, the trauma you had, right? And then once you have that, you can start moving into dreaming into what's possible. Some of us need that those transitional relationships in order to say, you know, this and something better. Yes. And right, right. Wow. Love that so much. And I love, I love how things work out non-linearly, right? Like it doesn't actually, the sequencing doesn't matter. It's more just about like the feeling state that you're shifting out of. And sometimes we need a person to help us move through that and to figure out what we don't want so that we know what we want. And I just, I also just want to double click because a lot of women, um, I feel like are, there's a lot of pressure in society biologically and, you know, kind of emotionally that there's this kind of, um, yeah, a lot of pressure put on women that certain things have to happen at a certain time. And, you yeah. know, I, I wonder if you have anything to say about that, because I just, I feel that it's so unfair, um, the conversations that are projected upon women in terms mm -hmm. of like their desires and their relationship choices. And, you know, it's interesting, like to, to be single in society, at least, you know, I could say anecdotally, um, it seems like that people sort of project a lot of stuff onto people who are, who yeah, are single versus right. in relationship. And I think both, both of them have their, their challenges and benefits, right? Absolutely. In fact, there've been studies that show that single women are much happier <laughs> than married ones. Um, you know, but it's true that when, you know, that we, and I think a lot of our projections onto the single woman, you know, typically are by other women, right? It's not typically married men who are projecting things onto the single woman. 
uh, other than maybe interest in her, uh, but not, you know, things about who she is or how sad she is or how lonely she must be or how, what it faulted she must, you know, or damaged she must be or whatever their stories are. Those stories come from their own scarcity, you know, and their own fears that they're now projecting onto this other person, what, you know, their fears about being single and probably why they settled. You know, I find that those women who project onto the single woman are typically women who aren't very happy in their own (laughs) relationships and have been trying on being single and are too scared. And so when they see you or whoever in their single bliss, then they, um, you know, they get a little triggered and they don't even know it. So then they just project all these sad things that they imagine they would feel if they were single onto the single woman. And I think we do that as a society because we've all been so conditioned to be scared of being alone. But what I can tell you is the number one way to really manifest beautiful love is to become blissfully single. Because once you are your whole delicious cake and you don't need, God, I hate that line from Jerry Maguire. Remember yeah. that movie, You Complete Me, when Tom Cruise, <laughs> well, because nobody completes you, right? When you are your whole gorgeous, delicious cake, someone else is the icing and makes it all the more yummy and delicious, right? But you are still unbelievably delicious on your own. And we've all known people like that, men, women, you know, but since we're talking about women, because they seem to be the ones that have the heart, get given the hard time for being single, not men. Um you know, we've all met those women who are like, and and a lot of them don't even, you know, match society's standards of ideal beauty, right? Like, you know, they may be 40 pounds heavier than the ideal. They may not look ideal, but they are like a freaking magnet for people. And they walk into a room and every potential partner wants to talk to them. And it is about their energetic frequency because your energetic frequency will make you a magnet for what matches your frequency. So if you walk into a room feeling like crap about yourself and and really in that place of shame or guilt or, um, you know, not feeling enough and you've really internalized other people's projections onto you or you've internalized them from earlier in your life, you will probably walk into that party and either attract someone who is a user and, or an abuser, or an addict, or someone who you don't, an active addict, someone who you don't really want to be with, um, because you're a frequency match for that, right, in those lower frequencies. So I think it's a really important exercise for all of us, but especially as women, to really start understanding that those kinds of opinions, I'm not saying when someone gives you authentic feedback that you don't try it on and and honor it and, and, and perhaps integrate it, but in general, other people's opinions are none of your business of you, right? Other people's opinions of you are really about them. It's not about you. And the problem comes when we internalize that and we take that into our own energy. Right, right. Absolutely. And I think for those that are more empathetic um, or can, uh, you know, I'm clear audience, so I can actually hear mm-hmm. people you know, hear people's thoughts. thoughts. And so is, oh God. yeah, I, I'm sorry yeah, to laugh, so I, I'm, but I'm you know, just imagining. Can you imagine in a relationship? The caffeine <laughs> you hear when you go into these I know, I'm, And so I, sometimes I'm like, wow, it's so interesting. Um, the amount of projections that are happening yes. and it's, you know, it's, I used to, when I was younger, I used to actually really take that in. Um, and now, you know, I think there's something important about, having your a strong self-concept and self-identity. Like yes. this is who I am. It doesn't actually matter at all what's going on in the external world. Like I now just give yeah. zero importance to the external world and just really focus on like, what is it that I, that I care about? How do I want to show up? And it's been so game changing because I think a lot of people who are empathetic, who can attune to other people's frequencies, yeah. we just, we sort of feel their frequencies and rather than getting entrained to that, we now the shift is like, we're, I'm, yes. Well, that, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's how I fell into quantum love as an empath myself and going through, you know, a really difficult time. Um, in particular with my, all my kids, you know, I was having, go, I had, my mother died of breast cancer and within a year, cause I didn't process the pain. I just went right to bypassing it, to making meaning and spiritually connecting with her and not really feeling the agony of her loss, which really was agony. 
I just didn't have time, didn't want to feel it. And within a year, I had breast cancer in the same breast with no risk factors, just like all of a sudden. And I had to completely stop my life and my family, not my husband. He was like steady, thank God. But my kids went off the rails and my oldest became suicidal. And I was desperate because I was trying one thing after another. And eventually I went to see this woman who became one of my greatest teachers, uh, this woman named Therese Rowley, who was a psychic, is a psychic medium. And she was the first one to tell me about the Claire's, right? You're Claire audience, Claire sentient, Claire empaths are all Claire sentient. We feel what other people are feeling. I am one too. But in my son's case, he was a Claire sentient who was feeling everybody else's feelings, but he didn't know the difference between his own feelings and someone else's. So he was like a cuckoo bird who was taking in the feelings of the world and thinking they were his. Um, And there were all sorts of interesting things that made sense once I understood that. But it was so powerful to learn that when I walk, because she's like, you have to be really careful of the energy you bring into the room. And I'm like, well, I always go in there, you know, positive. I know that she's like, no, 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 not just on the outside, on the inside. Like you have to shift into out of fear and anxiety and whatever yourself before you walk into the room with him. And when I started mastering that, it was like immediate. So for most empaths, part of our survival, the reason we're empathic in the first place comes from trauma, right? Because we had to be hyper vigilant and attuned in order to stay safe, in order to get love, in order to avoid abuse, whatever, you know, pick your poison that we had growing up, right? It came from a place of pain, but it's a superpower that we developed. And our tendency as empaths is to entrain to the world. And the most powerful thing an empath can do is set your own frequency, hold that energetic frequency and walk into the room and watch everybody in the room match you. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. I'm smiling because um, I, I've seen this work firsthand and it's just so amazing Like to become the magnet, walking into a room, setting mm-hmm. an intention, holding your own frequency. And uh, I can also relate, um, you know, as a kid, I also was taking in so much of the emotional world of everyone else and I didn't mm-hmm. know what that meant uh, for a long time. So it's amazing that uh, you were able to help your son through that. So con- congrats. Uh, I think a lot of yeah. a lot of uh, parents um, just don't know how to how to handle kids who are empathetic and what to do I with know. that. So. I know. I shout it from the rooftop, rooftops because I have three of them and it, it was a game changer for them to understand it um, and to understand. Like, I remember I knew my kid, my oldest really got it when he came home from, you know, because I didn't, I just told him what I was learning, what I thought, and I was expecting him to just roll his eyes and tell me I was an idiot like he mostly did back then. And, um, and he didn't say it. He said, you know, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I think what you're saying is true. And I said, okay, well, then let me do the other thing she said, which is to give you a grounding hug. And she taught me how, you know, to pull the energy in through the top of my head, circle it into my heart and send it into his, just all of this love, universal love. And I did that without saying what I was doing. And he completely, you know, this kid who's a teenager and barely lets me touch him just completely melted in my arms. To this day, he's 26 now. He still asks me for grounding hugs. <laughs> um, but it was a game changer. So he came home a week later. I didn't say anything else about it, lest he think I was invested and then reject it. And he came home a week later and said, you know, I was at school today and I was at my locker. I was in a good mood, you know, and all of a sudden I just felt so angry and depressed. And I looked over and there was a girl a few lockers down and I thought, oh, she must be angry and depressed. And like, that was the game changer for him. That was the beginning of everything for him. And, you know, for my other kids as well, understanding that um, as a superpower, but also something that needs to be managed and processed correctly, it really is a game changer. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Laura. I love that grounding uh, hug. Can you explain it one more time? I'm sure that folks listening are going to want to do that with their children. So. Yeah, I do it all the time. In fact, it cracks me up because when I want to give someone a good hug, I do it this way. And they always are like, whoa, <laughs> what did you just do? Um you pull, I mean, I teach this a lot of these meditations in Quantum Love and I'm actually have a new book out 
called, uh, it's an ebook. You can get it on my website called uh, You're Not Crazy, You're Just Ascending. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and it's how to survive and thrive in this wild new world. And I have all, you buy the book, you get like 20 different guided meditations. And I have a lot of guided meditations that teach you how to do this. But um, you pull, you, you imagine, you breathe in light through the top of your head. This is a great way to ground your system too, right? So you could breathe light in through the top of your head. And as you're kind of breathing in and holding for a beat, you imagine the light filling every cell of your body. And as you breathe out, you imagine it shooting out your tailbone deep, deep, deep into the earth and grounding you there. So, you know, doing, t- especially if you're someone who tends to be disassociated from your body and your feelings, doing that several times a day, just two or three breaths is huge. Mm. The hug that I'm talking about is a different version of that where you still pull the light in through the top of your head. As you breathe in, it goes into your heart center, right in the center of your chest. And in my experience, I I just really enjoy kind of circling it around for a second or even a millisecond just to give it some momentum, you know, in that spot and then shoot it out your heart into the heart of the person you're hugging. Mm. And they will feel it. And and the cool thing is that you feel it too. Like when I first started practicing this, either in a hug or a different version of it during sex, I was kind of doing it as a gift for the other person, you know, like, oh, let me just send this energy into them. But what I realize is the process of pulling it through my body gives me the benefits as well. Mm, wow. And it's also really, really important what I said about pulling that energy in because what I had done for decades before learning this is if I did share my energy with someone, I would share it from me, not through me. And boy, is that a difference because you will deplete the crap out of yourself if you are sharing from yourself energetically on every level, including this mm. one, right? But when you're sharing through you, when you're pulling that energy through you and sharing it, it takes nothing from you. It only gives you all the more. And it gives the other person a beautiful gift. Oh, I love that so much. And I can also feel the resonance between us uh, on this call and just the field that we've created. So it feels so heart opening and warm and expansive. And yeah, so I I already mm-hmm. feel that from you, <laughs> even even without the... You're entrained. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. So Laura, I know that we're at time, but I wanted to just ask, like, what sort of things have surprised you the most? most on this journey since you started doing this work, looking back? I mean, what what sort of has surprised you about human behavior, about relationships, about Mm. quantum love? I think one of the most surprising things for me as a couples therapist now for almost 30 years is that for all of my career until I really understood this, you know, couples therapy required the couple be there. And I would often have to spend so much time convincing the other partner to be there or working as much as I could with the one partner who was willing to come. And the coolest thing that I learned is, and it's so liberating for me as a, as a healer, is that it just takes one to change everything in the relationship. I don't need the couple anymore. I mean, it's great if I have the couple, but I certainly don't need them in order to help the one person who's there change everything. And it and it's so liberating and powerful, not only for me as a healer, but for all of us that we have that power. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would mention, and this is just what's coming to mind right now, I'll probably think of a million things when we lock off, but um, is that, you know, one thing that I learned and, you know, we don't have to, we don't have time to get into all this, but everybody who follows me or knows me, I'm very open about the earth shattering tragedy I went through a year and a half ago when my middle son was murdered with fentanyl poisoning. And that it was, you know, as anyone could imagine, the deepest and widest pain that's possible, I think, um, certainly for me. And one of the things that I've been so unbelievably grateful for and probably shouldn't have surprised me, but has, is that I really understood quantum love and was living it so fully when he died. I understood energy. And and so 
I immediately knew, even though I've been reeling since then from the loss of his being here on the planet, right, and in our family and in my day-to-day life and being able to touch him and hug him and squeeze his little beginning man hands and everything else and smell him, I know that energy can't be destroyed or created. It just changes form. And I would say that quantum love and having lived in quantum love for almost, you know, 10 years by the time he died, I, I think that's a huge part of what has saved me because not only was I able to really connect with the truth that he is just beyond the veil, he's just not in physical form anymore, but I also have learned that when I'm in those darkest, deepest, painful places and I allow myself to release, as we've been talking about, and to go into the pain and release the pressure valve and feel my system rise, when we are out of these physical forms of our bodies, we are vibrating at such a high frequency. You know, that's what the spirit world is. And they can't come down to our, us at our most dense right? At our most low frequency, when we're the most dense, the higher your frequency, the less density is there, right? So when I release some of that density and I feel, and you start to know what it feels like in your body to be in a higher frequency, and I feel that, it's like, then he can meet me in the middle. Wow. Mm. And that's where I can connect with him the most in those higher frequencies. So that's been a beautiful gift as well. Wow, Laura, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, You know, that's incredibly, I think, inspiring for a lot of people who have lost uh, loved ones, even just coming out of the pandemic. There's been so many stories of of Mm -hmm. loss. And, you know, it reminds me of the, this Rumi quote. Oh gosh, I I forget the- I'll meet you in between, right? In in the field. I forget it too, but I know exactly the one you're talking about. Yeah. It's like in the middle of, you know, between- Oh my gosh, now I want to look it up. <laughs> I'm going to look it up while we talk. I'm at my computer. Hold up. Yeah, because I think that that to me resonates, that place in between like the physical and the yeah, spiritual. I think about that all the and, time. Uh, and I love that it's an invitation for anyone who has lost someone that they really loved, that that those are the spaces that you can reconnect with those of us. Like you said, energy is never created or destroyed. And it also just gives... I mean, I think all of us a little bit of hope, right? And and the reality is like, we're all going to die. And I think it's also mm-hmm. a great reminder so that we do live our lives um, without kind of any regret and just really try as much as possible to stay in these high states of love. Yeah. And being here in this body is such a miracle and such a gift. Play with it, enjoy it, experiment with it explore it. You know, we're here in this body only once. Well, I mean, I think we'll be here and have been here a million gajillion times, but this experience we will only have once. The Rumi poem is out beyond ideas, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. Oh, that's true. We're all part of the same quantum field. Rumi knew it. Knew it. I love that. Wow. 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 Laura, thank you so much. Uh, what do you want to tell our listeners about their relationship wellness? What's sort of your main takeaway for people listening? What do you want to tell them to do today to become more quantum love, loving, or whatever it is that is your your bigger... Yeah, just like explore this and know. I think the main thing I want everyone to know is that we spend so much of our lives feeling at the effect of circumstances, people, feeling powerless, feeling frustrated, And of course, there's a place for that. But what I most want people to understand is that you have so much more power than you could ever realize. And all you have to do is open the door and start exploring and tapping into it. And, you know, as they say in the Course of Miracles, a miracle is just a teeny shift in perception. That's all it is. And once you make that shift and you start exploring, you know, some of these things that we've talked about, you will see 
immediate effects, not just in how you feel most importantly, but what reality starts to manifest in your life because we are all co-creating our reality. What The choice is whether we do so consciously or not. Amen. Uh, Laura, are there any resources that you can point folks to in order to learn more about you, your work, your latest book? Where can they find it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they can listen to my podcast. It's all about how to love and be loved better from a mind, body, and spirit perspective. It's called The Language of Love with Dr. Laura Berman, and that's anywhere you get podcasts. And they can come to my website, Dr. Laura Berman, and there's all sorts of blogs and articles and information. And you can also right there on the homepage, see my new ebook, You're Not Crazy, You're Just Ascending, How to Survive and Thrive in This Wild New World. And when you buy the book, it's $11.11, of course. (laughs) And when you buy the book, you get all the guided meditations. There's like 20 of them. Um, and uh, a video series be- of all kinds of interviews I did with experts because, you know, I was going through this and I didn't, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I interviewed all the experts and did all the research and that's what the book is about. So I'm really, that just came out. I'm really excited to share that. And you can follow me on social media, all at Dr. Laura Berman. Amazing, amazing. And we'll include the link in the show notes for those who are listening. Thank you so much for your time, Laura. This was so, so, so lovely. Um, I am going to be in a state of joy and playfulness after this conversation. Um, and that's Yay. my intention. So I hope the folks listening that you pick one or two feeling states that you want to be in after this talk and go live that. For our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learn about how to create quantum love and manifest the relationship that you want with Dr. Laura Berman. And you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. Thanks again.